Good evening, how are we all doing? Hope it is well. Give us a shout, the audio and video is coming through okay. A bite dark, because unfortunately that change to uh, OBS settings did not help. Um, what I might do actually is shove the exposure up here a bit and then maybe it'll look less terrible on your side. Uh, it's probably going to make clamping worse, but we shall endure. So 0.25. Eh, it's a little later. How's that? Boom. Cool. So, let's do the good evenings. See who's lurking around. So, good evening to Borodus and Darius and Davix, Unit Elevator Simulator, Infinisil, Kid, Pomna Pimp. Ooh, someone new. Um, Arpiawamus. <laughs> Our Primus. How you doing, man? Uh, Skinny Seahorse and Susuke. It is good to have you here. I do not see our regular bot, which means this probably isn't being recorded. Susuke Jose. Um, did I not say you? Damn, sorry. That means you weren't in the list. Twitch is lying to me. Audio and video, okay. Great to have that and great to see you back, one of them. And yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, had a busy, very busy last week helping some friends with some projects. Uh, so I have been snowed under, but I just realized that this is also not prepared because I am nothing if not about preparation. So I am nothing. Right, so we are going to try and do some bloom stuff today. I'm just going to reset those FBOs. And there is nothing to push. We are on episode 55, which is cool. And yeah, we're going to be working from here. So link to the chat. And we'll try and gather these up at the end. Medians in Chechnya. Cool. Audio and video fine over there. Excellent. We reach all places. Should I ping uh, Shimera to restart the bot? I mean, it's cool if it's here, but I also don't want to bother him. He's got other stuff to do. Um, again, it, like, as long as it's a, as long as he's not stressing out, then it's fine. He might be away as well. We'll see. But anyway, we're going to try and do some Bloom stuff, and this is actually going to be cool to um, <laughs> create a bot to restart the bot. Uh, probably true. Probably true. Um, this is going to build on some of the HDR work we did like a month ago, or whenever that was. Um, so hopefully that's not too fucked up. Um, we've got our nice scene from the other day. And so what I want to do is basically create a white ball behind here with a very high um, brightness value. Like a very, just, yeah, really high color value. And we'll try and bloom that out. And uh, yeah, see what we can do basically. So, not proper lights, but definitely get the effect. So these guys are, now let's actually go through. So. I'm going to assume we know the rough effect. It's, I don't know how to describe it. I'm so used to just calling it bloom. It's what causes these uh, light to kind of leak out of um, the object into the surrounding area. It's effectively a, a blurring effect. Um, and yeah, it, it just gives us nice cues on how bright something really is relative to other stuff. And so what we're going to do to kind of skim over this first part is we are going to take a scene, like our scene over here. We are going to do a high pass on it, which means we're going to cut everything off below a certain value. Um, and then we are going to blur that result and add it back to the original. And then we're going to do this in better ways to get better results. But we'll start just with this. Um, so I suppose the first thing we kind of need to do is we need to get... Well, I'd like to get the... Oh, what should we do actually first? Should we worry about that object first? Nah, that'll be farting around. Let's just see if we can get something we've already got. Let's get a high pass so we can cut off some of these colors here. So, what are we going to do? We must be rendering into... It has been a long time since I looked at this code, so this will be interesting. Uh, long time. Two whole weeks, which is many years in my memory's time. Um, hey, Barrett, good to see you, man. Made the new AAA game yet? Yeah, I hope that's not uh, hope that's not aimed at me. <laughs> cool. I haven't even got around to doing the swag either, um, which which will be done at some point. But that yeah, that 
went down that list pretty hard. Um, let's have a look. So the first thing that's done is uh, we're clearing an FBO and we are then looping through all the things and we're updating them and drawing them into that FBO. And then, oh yeah, in another pass, um, we're doing the FXAA and tone mapping and all that kind of stuff. So our scene FBO, if we go and have a look at that, we go look at where it's set up, but it's probably just easier to inspect it. Um, has a bunch of color attachments. So let's go and look at attachment. Scene FBO is zero. And we can see this is a GPU array backed by texture memory. So again, we're looking at an image within a texture in GL parlance. Um, it has an element type of RGBA 16F. So this is a, um, a four component half float two dimensional array, two dimensional array of, um, yeah, that's what it is, <laughs> of, of these uh, VEC4s. Um, what's going on? Uh, when Keppel is done, <laughs> are you going to make a video game? Um, unlike other lesbians. No, man, other people are making things. Um, I'm, I just like, oh, man, I just, I like the challenge. I love the idea of, like, looking at what was technically reasonable five years ago and saying, hmm, can a dynamic language do that? Or can DSLs within a dynamic language, could you do that interactively? Could you have that kind of thing? Um, and... There's lots of places where the answer is no, and there's lots of places where maybe, and that's kind of the bit I get excited about. So, un like until I feel like Lisp is for me the right choice for a game, I I'm not going to be using it for that. Like, if I had a game project that was definitely going to be just desktop and I really wanted to just do it in Lisp, then that'd be great and I'd get the motivation. But I just don't have that motivation yet, so I'm going to stick with tools because I fucking love tools. Um, and my day job's making games, so that's all right. Um, yeah, and there's lots of there's lots of game making going on. There's something about game jam going on soon, isn't there? Um, I think I saw uh, Borodus mention that in this Lisp Games IRC, which I accidentally went to a, a minute ago instead of going to R1 because I'm an idiot. Right. So what is going to happen is we are going to take this scene FBO and then we are going to. Um, do a high pass on that and remove all the stuff we don't need or we could just take two we could take this um the shader that actually draws all this stuff and we could just output to two attachments instead of one and one can have can be this and the other one can be threshold we'll see that actually that sounds like it might work so let's go to see where scene fbo is defined it's up here and so we're going to do this. So we're going to change it instead of just being um, one of these. That's interesting that works with just... Okay, I guess it goes like... Like that. Yeah, exactly like that. That thing that doesn't mean anything. Right, so... Two color attachments and a depth attachment. Same format. Uh, we're going to go reset FBOs and everything still works by the look of it. Yep, we're still here. Good. So that's okay. Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to go to see which uh, pipeline we're using for drawing. So if we go into things where we do lots of stuff, um, we have some pipeline with norms. And asim pipeline. Hmm. Okay. Um, well, all of this stuff that we're drawing here are uh, is asim meshes. So, and we've got a few bits down here that aren't. I think these are boxes in the sphere down here. Um, so we won't worry about those yet. We'll focus on this stuff. Um, yeah. Let's just so let's jump to the asim pipeline, which is in here somewhere. I still haven't had time to look into why that's jumping to the wrong place. I expect I'm like an out of date on slime or something like that, which is strange because I get that from Quick Lisp, so that should be up to date. Yeah, what could I be doing wrong there? I don't know, actually. Screwing up something though. Um, okay, so we got this pipeline and we have a frag stage with norms. In fact, both of these pipelines use that, which is awesome. 
Um, so when we make a change to one, it's going to affect both of them, both pipelines, I mean, so that's really cool. And what we can see is we have a final color here. So let's go and put this in a variable. So we go final color if it's not how you write that. Um, we right um, is now in a variable and we'll return final color. So far, no change. Just to prove we are actually live coding that shader still. Make sure we haven't crashed. We make a change. That's obvious. So we've got final color. And now instead of returning one value, we're going to return two. So we do values, final color, final color. And that is now writing into both of those two attachments in our FBO, which is great. So now we've got two exact copies um, of this, which is a good start. Um, da -da 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 -da. Ooh, I'm actually falling behind, but damn. Lovely to have so many people in chat again today. Uh, game Jam soon. Awesome. October. Um, 10 out of 19 star. Oh, that's, sorry. <laughs> I read that as 10 out of 19. Can you tell I'm tired? <laughs> 19th of the 10th. Okay. Of, of October. Nice. I did not pass that. Um, where are you? Autumn Lisp Jam. There is a link, which I will try to remember to put into the YouTube video. And... Coffee. That is a good idea. Why don't I get this poor excuse for a hot mug of milk with caffeine? And I'll, um, yeah, go from there. Deferred rendering. Well, I mean, anytime you're caching something and doing things with it later, it's kind of deferred. But we're, I don't think we do any deferred lighting in this. Uh, I think we're all kind of, um, yeah, forward based on the lighting. But um, we can do. I actually, I don't think we'll end up doing that today. What we are doing is we're writing the scene into now two attachments that are identical, and we're going to treat this one slightly color, uh, slightly differently. Let's see how they do it in here because I'm interested in that. Uh, so extracting bright color. So the first step requires us to uh, extract two images from the, uh, from a rendered scene. Okay, that's exactly what this guy is doing. He's using two um, attachments on the FBO and writing one output to that and one to the second so let's have a look um, this is all the GL side setting up which ours was a bit easier we just copied a line um, and then in the shader that's a way of doing it interesting so we go frag color is and this seems to be the final uh, color is got there and then if it calculates brightness and then if brightness is greater than one uh, this is the color so and otherwise we just set it to black it's interesting that we set the alpha to one fair enough not going to argue let's go with this approach um, let's just take this whole block of code here Whoop. paste it in ours and we'll have a look at replicating it But we don't need this. Okay, so for whatever reason, uh, we're going to start with um, calculating uh, brightness, which is the dot product of the final color. Um, yeah, do. Let's try dot instead. Um, swizzle, final color. X, Y, Z, we only need that portion, um, the last component we're using for Luma because uh, this is going to be fed into, ah, that's interesting actually. Hold on, is this the right stage? Right, actually we need to split this up a little because this is after tone mapping all that kind of stuff and I don't think we want that. Um, So do the lighting calculations and output results, check whether the fragment's higher than the threshold, blah, blah, blah. But that can't be where we're doing the, can't be doing tone mapping before then because the point of the 
doing the HDR was we wanted to like put our threshold somewhere in that broader range and then we can remap afterwards. So it does sound like we need to do a few more passes. Let's have a look. So does he mention time mapping in this? Back down here. Okay. So yes, this is in the blending both textures stage. This gamma is defined up here. Loading things out of those textures, which are going to be floating point textures. Um, adding them together. Tone mapping. And gamma correcting, which is built into our tone mapping operator we're using at the moment. And then outputting the result. So, I know we've skipped like the entire thing here. Um, but the point is we're going to need a first pass. So, we're going to make some changes. Um, Kid just says, just write a parser that converts the C into CL. <laughs> Not today. We've already, we've already got the one that does GLSL to Lisp and the other way, so that's fine. Um, I have been working. The one thing I have given myself a little time to do over the weekend was to um, work on a static type checker, which I'm having way too much fun with. I love it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I, I, I won't round about that all episode this time, but uh, it, it's been really fun. Okay, so what are we doing? What are we doing? We want to not do this luma and final color business here actually we'll get rid of this brightness um and we are going to keep our two output values so final color that's the tone mapping um so yeah color has got to be the end point We've done all our lighting stuff and now we've got something here. So let's take let's take these folks and remove them. Um, and we're gonna output color twice. And that's gonna look pretty weird, but kinda cool. Um, so lots of things are outside of our range now, which is fine. Um, we are then going to do that stuff we were meant to be doing a second ago. So let's do that brightness thing and try and work out what that was all about. Brightness, uh, dot product of swizzle, color, RGB, XYZ. <laughs> <laughs> the letters. I think I was doing that in Russian. Um, let's take these same numbers. 0.2126. And I'm going to get to the questions very soon. Uh, 0.0722. I don't know why this is the threshold, but whatever. Um, and then we go. We can say, what is this going to be? This is going to be, yeah, bright color. Why not? Same name. Bright color is, and we're in Lisp, so if isn't uh, a form expression is going to return a result just like anything else. So we say that if brightness is greater than one, um, then the result here is going to be like four. Um, where we have color. Wait a second, let's go and check what the type of color is. Because I'm not seeing it. Colors right there, Chris. Have a look. Um, light amount and albedo. Albedo came from a texture, was gamma corrected, and then we took X, Y, Z of it. So it's already a VEC3, which means we don't need to do this. And it also means we do need to do this. And what was the other one? Zero, 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 one. Okay. So no harm so far. Well, if we do this now, hopefully we should see that a lot of stuff disappears and we get a few bright points. These are the bits we're going to bloom. Um, so that's going to be cool. Ooh. 
Fubi bloomed. Right, so we're going to swap these round because the first buffer we're going to use as our um, our regular scene color, and then the second one's going to be our bright colors. And let's see what's going on. So, whoa. Um, LLVM to common lisp? You kidding? Hey, Bedigan. That's fun. And bonkers. When was that from? A year ago. Oh, Froggy as well. Nice. That's cute, though. Oh, I'll have to look at that. I have been looking into LLVM because obviously they have... I want to do an optimizing compiler at some point soon, which I've never done before. And so I was really interested in seeing their kind of transformation passes and stuff like that. And that's... Oh, oh it's fun to look into that stuff. Um, Barrett's saying, where's Colleen today? We don't know. We do not know. Um... Iota is awesome. It was created for um, Mezzano. Oh, cool. That's the operating system, right? The Lispy operating system. Kid says a static type, Chepaga. Yes. Now I'm going to get distracted if I go and start looking at links for uh, Mezzano and all that kind of stuff. But I do see a tweet from Joswig, and he is really interesting. Like, the, the stuff he... The man knows fucking everything about common lesson. It's nuts. Um, anyway. Da, 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 da. We've done this bit. Right. This bit is done. Let's get back to some kind of focus. <laughs> In a massive break from form. Okay. Let's see what we've got. So we've extracted our bright color in the way they're doing it there. I mean... Let, let, won't worry about that for now. Um, so because we have lots of... this is They were saying this is why this works so well with HDR rendering. Because we've got high dynamic range, color values can exceed one, which allows us to specify a brightness threshold outside of the default range. It gives us much more control of what an image is, what of an image is considered as bright. Um... Without HDR, we'd have to set less than one. Yeah, we've just got a lower range of numbers we can use for things. It kind of makes sense. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that thing we had a minute ago. Where was it? Boop. Oh, what did I do? Oh, yeah, I swapped. Uh, that wasn't right. Something like that. Yeah. Um, we're going to take this image and we're going to blur it. And then we're going to, yeah, we'll do stuff with that. I'm so articulate. Let's have a look. So with an image um, of the extracted bright regions, we now need to blur the image. We can do this with a simple box filter, as we've done in the past. Uh, but let's do something that actually looks decent, and we'll do a Gaussian blur. Gaussian blur? Gaussian blur? It's Gaussian, isn't it? Gauss. Gaussian. One of those. In the post-processing blur, we simply took the average of all the surrounding pixels. This is one of the other tutorials they've got. Um, and while it does give us an easy blur, it doesn't give the best results. A Gaussian blur is based on the Gaussian curve, which is commonly described as a bell-shaped curve, um, giving high values close to the center that gradually wear off to its distance. Uh, to, ah, over, dis over distance. Yeah, that's what I said. That's what I was meant to be saying anyway. The Gaussian curve can be mathematically represented in different forms, but generally has the following shape. What is interesting about it too is that the area underneath that curve is one, if I remember correctly. Um, which is kind of nice. We're spreading that, spreading things around in a kind of energy conserving kind of way. This is one of the things I don't really understand with Bloom. I'm not sure where it fits in the whole kind of PBR thing. Is it just a post process? Because it kind of fucks with, and I should being very careful about things. It probably is, I mean, it's probably not a real phenomenon, is it? In, in It's more like you're simulating things on the optics or on the eye. So it's a little different, I guess. I'm not really sure. So normally what we would do is, um, well, the, the the primitive way of doing um, this kind of blur is sampling all of the pixels in the neighborhood. So for this guy here to calculate its color, we're going to have to sample all of these and then do some math on those. Um, but that is a lot of uh, pixels to sample. And they're saying um, that so if it was a 32 by 32 pixel kernel, so area that we're accumulating, 
um, we would have to sample a total of 1,024 times for every single fragment, um, which is going to be more than even, even than the pixels on your screen because obviously some fragments are discarded. They haven't been depth discarded yet. So yeah, that's kind of interesting. Well, what do they have been actually? Because we're going to write to an FBO, so there should only be one layer. Um, so I guess, yeah, 1,024 times for every single pixel in that FBO. Um, but what's cool is we can separate these out. We can blur in one direction, and then we can blur that horizontally blurred image in another direction, and that will give us something very suitable. Um, and apparently the results are exactly the same, but it means rather than doing 1,024, we end up doing 62 samples per pixel, which is massive savings. So this is cool. So this is called two-pass Gaussian blur. Um, Let's have a look. This guy Jose saying, oh, now you can use a blur kernel, but we want to do the separable one. Um... <laughs> I don't get that reference, Barrett, but I'll catch up soon, I expect. Um... Or if it's just how long it's taken me to kind of lose the lose the track <laughs> so oh, i gotta get this up here one second because there is truth being delivered by elevator simulator which is just yes that so we're gonna do that to our uh piece of work as well so anyway let's let's get moving let's get moving um let's get back to play with lisp um we're going to need another FBO, um, so let's just go scene FBO2, um, let's go up to here, sometimes it jumps to the right definition and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so now we've got two of these that are the same size, the same number of attachments, I think we need the same number of attachments, we'll see, it doesn't matter, we can always get rid of some. Uh, let's reset the FBOs. We know that exists. So now we should have seen FBO2 and seen FBO. And those are not equal. So EQ, that, and that are no. groovy. So now what are we doing? Let's go down to where we draw stuff down here. Um, and at first, actually, we'll just dump the uh, whatever we're doing in here. So let's... Let's make a new pass. So, um, what's the best way of doing this? So let's just do P fun G. Um, so G blur horizontal. Ah, let's just do H blur. H blur vert. And this is going to be just going to take a quarter, I guess. So the vert is going to be a vec2. And see if I can remember how to do anything. Values is, okay, so the position that comes in is going to be from minus one to one. So the first thing we do is we just say, yeah, that's the vertex position. Then we need some UV coordinates uh, because we're going to be sampling the texture. So we're going to remap that input. So we divide by... Um, 2 and offset um, by 0.5 as well so plus 0.5 so it goes from minus 1 to 1 to minus 0.5 to 0.5 and then we add 0.5 which is 0 to 1 so that should be good d on g um, h blur uh, frag why not we're going to take a vec 2 as our UV and we are going to take a uniform which is a, uh, just call it SAM for sampler and it's gonna be a sampler 2D and we're gonna call texture on SAM at the current UV so let's turn this into a pipeline so this is our basic put texture on the screen um, pipeline H blur P line just Vague naming thing I've been doing recently. H blur vert, which takes a vec two. H blur frag takes a vec two. There's our pipeline. Now we can go over here, comment out this, say, well, just compile that to make sure everything disappears. Oh, is that a clear color? Whatever. Um, we're going to go map G H blur 
pipeline. Um, that's a function. We're passing in, I guess Nineveh is going to give us our um, quad stream, our stream of vector twos that make a quad. And then we're going to say Sam is, and it's going to be, I guess, the first attachment, or no, it's going to be the second attachment of um, our FBO. So that means we need um, to sample the texture. So if we just bring up the REPL again quickly, and we look at our um, scene FBO that we're rendering into, and we go to attachment one of that, and we've got this GPU array. We need to be able to sample from that. We need to get the texture uh, for that attachment, and then we need to sample this. So we should set that up up here. Now we already have it for attachment one, which is called the scene sampler. Um, as we can see here, we get attachment text just like we did here, and then we sample it, and we shove it in this. And we've got a depth sampler as well, which I'm not even sure we're using, but whatever. Um, we're going to call this bright sampler. And we're going to just copy this. This is going to get messy before the end of the stream, by the way. <laughs> just in case you've forgotten the last two weeks how messy everything always gets on this thing. Um, okay, so now hopefully... Um, when we get down here, oh, that's not going to be populated yet, is it? If we just go, well, bright sampler is currently nil. So let's uh, reset those FBOs. Uh, and bright sampler now has a sampler. We go down here, and where's that map that we just wrote? Oh, there it is, Sam. Um, so bright sampler. No! Uh, no function called value was found in this while compiling something in Vario. So my guess would be I'm a fool. That's a safe bet. Um, blah. Here we are. Um, value. It's meant to be values. Continue. There we go. So that is our... That is the second attachment from our first pass. We could also swap this out here. My eyes weren't doing a number on me. And we could say um, scene sampler, which is the first attachment, and we see what we had before. So boop. that's what we've got to work with, to start with at least. And that's staying there because it's awesome. OK, so now we can start implementing this. Um, this is the fragment shader. So they're doing, um, we're doing five samples on the horizontal. It's going to be a five by five kernel. So this is our horizontal sampling. Um, oh, in fact, we, we, this shade is going to do both directions. So that's fine. Uh, we can work with that. But it has been too long since I looked at the chat. So let's do that. But I'm just going to paste this first. And that's probably too small for the stream. We will endure. Right. Okay. So, what is going on? Right. So, where was it? We had a dose of truth from Elevate Simulator. There we are. And then there's videos, which I can't watch, Barrett. I can't do that on the stream. I'm going to get so distracted. I already have problems. Um... <laughs> Turns out this is on topic after all. Bloody hell. Bloom. Gorse in New Zealand. Yep, that's the... Uh, that's a plant. I'm sure there's bloom in there somewhere, but I'm not going to go looking for it. <laughs> right, cool. So, we have... Um, this is... We're calling Sam. In fact, let's rename it to Image. Why not? Let's, uh, let's try and follow their naming convention. Come on. Oh, of course, yeah, because I've re <laughs> I just renamed it. Funny how when you rename stuff, that has an effect on things. Um, Sam is now going to be image. Recompile that, say continue, and then we get back to render where we can carry on coding. And let's just start implementing this. So one of the things that gets passed up is um, a thing saying if it's horizontal or not. And that's going to be a boolean. Um, also passes up. Um, some weights. That's one of the things actually Vario doesn't support right now is specifying default values for uniforms and I think I really need to do that at some point. 
it's kind of ugh, to not do that. Well, no, it's kind of dumb. I haven't supported that anyway because I mean, Lisp has syntax for default values. It seems like a no-brainer to do that. So I guess I would have this be something like um, this and blah blah blah. One, two, three. But this is an array, so I guess it would have to be Vario code that goes there. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, that'd be fun. We'll think about doing that then. Um, for now, I don't think I'm going to use that as a uniform because we can recompile really easily. I don't think there's an advantage to us making a uniform yet. It's easier for us to just make a variable for that. So um, weight is vector. Um, and then we're going to go and take these numbers. Ah, oh. yeah, it's really fun having done Vario and having obviously just made up the type system in that thing. It's really nice to, and like obviously having run into lots of problems and deciding that overloading is a pain in the ass. Um, yeah, uh, overloading? Override, no. Many, like many, <laughs> oh God, many implementations of a function with the same name with different arguments. Overloading, right? Um, or is that the... Oh. Why is my brain? I just don't want to think C sharp right now. Um, let's keep it together. So let. So text offset is one divided by uh, texture size. That's a function. That's cool. And then the image um, at uh, too many different languages. So. Texture size, the zero here is going to be the level of detail argument, I'm pretty sure. So if we do CVV, um, we can see that the second argument is LOD. So this lets you pick a certain MIPAP level, um, which is cool. So one over texture size. Oh, that's it. Cool. Um, and then result is texture, image, UV. Swizzle to RGB and then um, multiplied oops, by weight of zero. Uh, a ref weight zero. There we go. Okay, so that's so that's basically we're sampling the center of our grid right now. So in this whole grid that we're doing, we're we're setting up this one. And then I guess we're going to loop over the rest and... Is that right? Do, 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 do. No, that can't be right. Oh, yeah, I guess it is. Ah, so the way he's storing the weights must be interesting because... I would have imagined you were sampling from here to here, like looping over each one of these rows and accumulating, which would mean that and you're, you're using the weights, like weight zero would be here, weight one, weight two, weight three, weight four. So I'm kind of surprised to see. Hmm, interesting. We'll see very soon. I guess this is, uh, we'll see. <laughs> Let's just go with this and see what happens. So we've got result, and then we're going to go if horizontal. And then we've got to go progon because we've got a whole block of stuff going on here. And we need another progon. And then we're going to get things done. So there is four i b b below five. So we're going to just do do times um, because it's just a bit lithier. So i is, oh, in this case, i is one. Um, ah, all right. Okay. So it does uh, zero and then just does one to five instead. So um, actually, maybe we'll do the four then. So four i is one and then less than i five and. Um, plus plus i black um, and then we're going to increment result by something rather similar to this by the look of it plus some offset stuff so let's start with this and we'll tweak it
<laughs> what is happening? Shouldn't I have done this on June 16th? Again. What? <laughs> That's it. I'm going to have to leave you at Rutanti for a second. Right, okay. What have we got here? So we've got a bunch of stuff. Um, and then we're timesing by weight. So that's our times by weight here. So we're modifying this UV. That's the interesting bit right now. So let's drop down that RGB. Let's look at this. It's going to be UV plus. Um, oh, I, I guess this is going to be a 10 by 10 kernel then. And these are just the weights from the center outwards. That would make some sense because then we're not duplicating. So yeah, zero is the middle and he's walking out. Yeah, that's what it is. And that's why we're doing a plus and a minus in this. Cool. Okay, that makes some sense. Times i, and then uh, what's the thing of the multiplying by i? So x of text offset. Cool. Um, and that's this is meant to be a vec2. Which makes sense. And then we do zero. Cool. This is getting a bit wide, so we'll have to move this later. Uh, but that's all right. For now, it works. So we do this, we do it again, and this time we are subtracting. Um, but everything else is the same because we're walking out from that center point out to the edges. So that's, that makes perfect sense then. You're sampling UV right in the middle. We're using weight zero, and then we walk out using the rest of the weights, and that is fine. Um, and then the other way is we just doing, it's just, let's just do it. Actually, seeing as this is a for loop, uh, we don't actually need this program here because everything else is just inside that scope. Um, let's do this, this, and this is where I'll find a bug in the compiler. Just, I can just feel it coming. Right, so zero is gonna be first because now we're walking in the vertical direction and we're interested in Y rather than X and it did not crash, that's interesting. Um, so that's cool. And then instead of just doing this, we are going to write the final color, which is result and one. And now we get something, oh look, vertically blurred. Nice. So I go do this again so we can do the before and after. Before, after. Nice. First try. First try. Right. And we should be able to pass a boolean to this to tell it to do it horizontally as well. So let's try that right now, actually. Let's go to play with this. And let's go to image, which was down here. And instead we'll say horizontal, horizontal. Yeah, I know. Horizontal is true. Fuck you. What is this? Ooh. Do I have a problem passing bulls? No way. That would be so stupid. Value T is not of type sine byte 32. This looks like some kind of idiot. Right. Oh, debug time. Let's uh, let's comment out this code. I <laughs> say I wish I could. Oh, I don't want you to lose your insanity. I just can't take it full to the face right when I was focusing. But that's good. Um, so this, yeah, you don't go anywhere. We need you here. Emotional support. Um, okay, so what are we doing? The pipeline is wrong. Um, the bit that uploads the uniform. For horizontal. Let's have a look. When horizontal, blah blah blah. Um, it puts the, the value for horizontal in val, and then it does a uniform one i, which I guess is how you upload a boolean. So this takes an int, but instead we just take the val and try and shove it in, which is a boolean. So this is wrong. That's a nice bug in Keppel. So let's go fix that real quick. So go the works. I hope this is easy to fix. Uh, core pipelines, and then we wonder where the fuck is this going to be? Probably in uniforms because it's called uniforms. Um, but it also might be to do with the signer generation, so we'll have to go look at that. But this is the function that we're trying to use. Yeah, it's not going to be here, is it? It's going to be when we generate assigners for all this stuff. 
Like so we're picking for ints and bools, we're picking this function, which is the correct one to use, and that's great. Um, but it's in here that we actually generate all the code for each type. So let's see if how does it work? Hmm. Wow. This might actually be a bit of a problem. Local arc name. Oops. Gotcha. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be intriguing. So make sampler assigner, no, make UBO assigner, no, make SSBO assigner, no. Uh Make simple assigner. Yes, this is exactly what I want. Da, dun, 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 dun. Let's have a look. Make a signer where the let forms are. Type sign byte 32. Yes. Um, okay. Val only in that one place, yeah. I had just relied on the idea that um, yeah, there was a single Lisp object that mapped to the correct type and all the other ones, so it's like, uh, it's an int 32, it's gonna be an um, yeah, an unsigned, oh, sorry, a, a sign 32, um, a sign byte 32 in Lisp. But now we've got to actually, yeah, we've got to map those values slightly differently. So I think I'm going to file an issue for this instead. So we go to Keppel and go to issues and fix this next time. Um, bool upload, uh, bool uniforms don't uh, take booleans. Um, yeah, GL uses uh, uniform i1 or 1i, whatever it was. Um, this expects 32-bit uh, int, and we are trying to pass oh, this boolean. Bam, bam, bam. Good. That is going to be, it's going to be not too hard a fix, but it will be a little messy. I can either hack it in or just make do for now. And I'd rather make do. So if we go back to play with verts, if we go back to the file, rather than um, passing in true, if we just pass in one, yeah, then we get our horizontal blur and zero, we get our vertical blur. And I hope that's showing up well enough in the stream. So that's our two components of this blur. Um, hack it in. No, no. Damn shoulder devil. It's going to be nuts if I ever get time down to uh, New Zealand. <laughs> it's going to be a mess with us two idiots hanging out. Luckily, the world is safe for a while longer. Say no to drugs. Fuck you. Coffee's the only way I get through. Right. Um, Okay, so let's, that's fine. Um, you can see we basically split the blur filter into horizontal and vertical section based on whatever value um, we set the horizontal uniform. We base the offset distance on the exact size of a texel attained by division of one over the size of the texture. Um, for blurring an image, we create two basic frame buffers, each with only a color buffer texture. Um, ours have depth as well, but that's kind of redundant. We don't need that. Um, then after we've obtained an HDR texture and extracted the brightness, uh, we fill one of the ping pong frame buffers with the brightness texture and then blur the image 10 times, five times horizontally and five times ver vertically. Okay. So that means we are going to be flipping backs and forwards. We're going to write into one and then we're going to, yeah, we're going to like, we're going to write the initial 
brightness uh, values this on when this was unblurred into one which we did and then we're going to blur it into this one and then we're going to take this one as the input and blur it and write it into this one and then we're going to take this one as the input and blur it into this one and ping pong backs and forwards so um Two basic frame buffers, each with only a color buffer texture. Um, that's interesting because the first thing we did was we... Hmm. Are we going to share the texture from the other frame buffer? I hope not. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, this, this makes sense. So let's go and make our ping pong uh, frame buffers. <sighs> so let's do that up here. Uh, this is gonna get, this is gonna get unwieldy. Um, it's gonna be, we'll call them ping and pong because that's, <laughs> that's gonna cause problems later on. Uh, so ping and pong. And then we are going to have a sampler for each because we're going to need to be able to read from, from both of them at different times. We read from ping, we write into pong, then we read from pong and write into ping. Um, so we need this and this and this and this, and we need to set all these up, which we do down in F set up FBOs, just like all the other ones. Um, so let's do ping just has one attachment like that and we're going to make pong the same so pong is this great and then we're going to do set of um, ping sampler to be and it's going to be exactly the same as this stuff so I'm not going to try and come up with it again we get the attachment from the right FBO we get the texture from attachment zero because there's only one attachment in this thing anyway we're going to sample that. We're going to put that in ping sampler. Pong sampler is pong. Oh, one thing I did start doing on Keppel while I was away was at the moment when we bind an FBO, um, it maps them in a particular way. So if you've got um, if you've got two attachments, then the first output from a fragment shader goes into attachment zero. The second attachment, the second output goes into attachment one, and so on. Right, so you can have a number of those depending on your driver implementation, yada yada yada. Um, but GL also allows you to specify which output goes to which um, which attachment. So you might have an attachment, um, you might have one shader that's going to write into attachments zero and one, and then another one which writes into um, two and three, and that's completely valid. But Kevl doesn't expose that properly yet. So what I'm wanting to do is something like. Um, with FBO bound, uh, the FBO, and then I want you to be able to say draw buffers. And then specify. So we will just say uh, two and three, which means the first output from the pipeline is going to go into attachment two, and the second one's going to go to attachment three. Now there's a few design decisions around here that I've still got to work out. Um, because A, there's a performance thing. Um, to call the GL function, which I think is just called GL uh, draw buffers. It is, um, but this looks like it's been wrapped up in a nice way. I'm not going to look at that one now. I want the real function. Yes, you pass in two, and you pass in a pointer to a C array uh, with those things in. Now, if we're allocating that every time that we do with FBO and then freeing it, that's stuff being put on the heap, and I'm not really happy about that. Um, so I'd rather not do that. So there's a couple of options. I have seen when I was messing around with doing uh, SIMD stuff in SBCL that sometimes um, SBCL can stack allocate your um, FF, uh, your CFFI stuff. So when you do something like uh, with FBO, in fact, I don't know this for certain, but one of the things I was seeing with data alignment made more sense if I assumed that the thing was allocated on the stack and it only happened when the, the data that being allocated was quite small. 
So if you say with FBO bound, with FBO bound? No, that's not what I'm talking about at all. If you do CFFI uh, with foreign object, and you say X is the name of the variable, and um, what am I doing? Oh yeah, then you specify the type, so say float, and then maybe you have a count of those as well. So if you have just this, for example, I was noticing that uh, if you just had four floats, these actually got stack allocated, and then suddenly the worries about things being assigned on the heap obviously go away. You don't get information on what threshold that is. So I'm thinking if you do less than four, or four or less rather, um, then we'll assume you're gonna get stack allocated and just use with foreign object. And otherwise, because we've got that context object, the capital context that's passed around, we can just allocate a small uh, chunk of scratch memory on there and just use that. Um, so we'll just write into that memory and then use that in place. And then you don't have to free anything because every time that we'll just overwrite that data every time it's used. Uh, so that's where I'm going with that. I've still got a few things I don't like because one thing we're doing here is we're hard coding that it's gonna be attachment two and three. So maybe you want to specify that like with a variable. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the best way because I want the ability to specify this statically because I want to omit the exact code um, so the optimizer can get it and fuck about with it. But yeah, so I've got a bit of design work to do there, but that is currently in process because I know it's one of the missing features in Keppel and it's been bugging me for a while. So that's cool. Uh, Baggers is the Malik on the GPU. Um, well, to a degree when you do gen buffer, um, yeah, you just get a block of memory and then you, you're your push kind of dictates how large uh, that chunk of memory is. Also with the a lot of the newer texture additions from like 4.5 and 5 up, or is it 4.4 and up, you have quite a bit of control over what pages are resident. So you've got huge virtual memory space for your GPU. Um, you can basically alloc up or like a whole ton of memory and then only make certain pages of it resident. And so you can basically implement all of your kind of your own memory manager um, for the GPU if you're doing like tons of compute or something like this or you just know what the fuck you're doing because I don't but it's so cool that you can um, and so I want to support it so we'll get to that that's another that's a, another whole set of shit to add to Kepler at some point what was I doing? what was I doing? we made ping and pong and ping pong sampler um, and so let's uh, reset FBOs again cool so that's done um Every time we do that, I just realize we're leaking a bunch of stuff because I don't clean up a bunch of these. Meh. Never mind. Um, that's fine. Actually, we should forget. Uh, <laughs> scene FBO2. Um, thing. Bonk. But right now, to be honest, I'm get, I'm trying to get a bit more done on the static type checking stuff before I get back into Keppel again. I just, when that stuff clicked and then suddenly the actual mechanism of some of this type checking stuff made sense and it's quite simple. So I probably will have to do a video on it in some time making a static type checker because it's fucking fun. And you can get a lot of more, you can get a really good type inference for not much work or at least better than C Sharp and Java. There's reasons they can't do some stuff, but you know, Haskell-y style inference in not that much code. It's it's a lot of fun. Um, more on that another week. Actually, I'll probably end up talking about it more now. But uh, yeah, what are we doing? We've made our ping pong buffers. So then we're going to blur. And instead of drawing out here, we are going to draw it into with FBO bound. And the FBO is going to be ping. And the this needs to be in brackets. We map G, so now this is going to go away. And so we wrote that into ping, and then we are going to do um, I guess we do this and pong, and we blur, and we say this time we're going to do it horizontally. Hey, things buzzing all over the place. We've been testing apps and a load of local notifications going off on different phones around the flat now. 
Um, what else is going on? So we have, this is completely incorrectly named now because I thought we we're gonna have two different pipelines for different directions, but that's fine. Um, come on, Chris, look at the actual thing you're doing. What is this? Um, we're writing into ping and then we're writing into pong. Uh, the first time we're writing from the bright sampler. Um, is that correct thing to do? Yes, we're writing, yeah, we wrote our values into the bright sampler, then we're gonna um, write them into ping, and then we're gonna take the um, ping sampler, and we're gonna read from that, and we're gonna write into pong. And then, just to so we can test things, we're gonna draw a texture, and we're gonna pass in the um, pong sampler, and hopefully uh, we get something that's been blurred in two directions, and it looks fucking terrible. That's a completely square blur. Um, that's just, Horrifying. How disappointing. Oh, wait. Maybe it's not so bad. No, because these values look like they're a lot less than one. I don't mind where it's clamping and it looks hard because there's a bunch of values we can't see. But that looks nasty. What have I done wrong? What have I done? Ping and pong. Oh, here. There, float buffers too. Don't think I do anything stupid and draw text when it comes to float buffers. Hmm. Odd. What does it look like from ping sampler? Well, that looks like our first one. Uh, that looks broad too, actually. Is this some horrible resampling shit? Hmm. Let's march on and then, because we're going to need the rest of the code anyway, and then we'll we'll come and see what that was. Um, trying to think of what will cause that. Wait, let's have a look. it says, thanks for entertaining the Malik tangent. Of course, man, no problem. It's really interesting. Um, interesting how when you wrote uh, with foreign object x float, Emacs showed x back at the bottom. Yeah, that's just, uh, yeah, I just thought it was a function call. Bless it. It's fine. Um, Arasus, sorry for mispronouncing your name, but he's saying there's no reason nowadays not to have at least Scala level type inference. Dude, yeah, like you can, the, the you should be having at least the basics in there. I mean, like certain levels of uh, change are allowed for different kind of language features, but yeah, you can do better, you can definitely do better. <laughs> Barrett doesn't like the brittle static language mentioned. Um, that's the thing I definitely whatever I want I need to be able to redefine just like we're doing with the um, GPU stuff I mean that's statically typed but um, the inference is pretty poor um, and yeah so it would be nice to have something better but still as long as we can recompile and our effects kind of percolate so everything gets updated it's not so bad right so let's do, what are we doing? Um, oh yeah, we've, we've jumped ahead of it. So let's have a look at this. Generated two um, FBOs, generated two textures and set everything up, which is what we did as well. Um, is there anything stupid we've done in here? No, we've got the same, I mean, he's doing RGB rather than RGBA, but whatever. Um, Screen width, screen height. Yeah, that's what we're doing too. It just takes it by default from the uh, current viewport. RGB, yes. That's just saying it's a VEC3. Floats, just saying it's float components. Um, 
Yep, that's fine. Ooh, filtering. Definitely should think about this. In fact, I should probably have checked that for earlier stuff as well. And he was setting up FBOs up here. Min filter and magnify filter is linear and then clamp to edge. And is that the same down here? One would expect. So let's just take that for a second and see what we've got. Um, because that is going to matter. Doot. It's very easy for me to get a bit stupid cocky when I'm using Keppel and just like, look, look at all that code. I don't need all that stuff. Um, let's just remove that. Um, so I end up then skipping something important, which is dumb. So let's take our um, ping FB, uh, ping, ping sampler. Yes, we're talking about the filter which are going to be sampling parameters, I think. So, but there'll be. Yes, so. I can't. <laughs> What's the params here? Um, how do you get the parameters for this stuff? Param? No. Um, thought it was sample so then when you when you call sample you can pass in the params oh yeah and then there are just functions for accessing them so magnify filter and minify filter which I mentioned here so if we do um, minify filter of the ping sampler uh, we can see it's linear mipmap linear which we don't want um, in fact we should be a bit careful when this is being created because this is just going to go and make itself um, a texture of the right size. And if it's doing that by default, then there is a chance that it's going to have done something sensible, but inconvenient for us. Um, and assign mitmaps. Mitmap levels. Oh, okay. Let's just inspect this object. Uh, yes, it has, oh no, it's only got one mipmap level. It has, so that's basically, yeah, no mipmaps, that's good. But, yeah, okay, so our sampling params are wrong, basically. That's good, so basically down here, and I'll say basically a thousand times because it makes it basic, as everyone knows. So minify filter, fuck you, minify filter, is meant to be do, 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 GL linear. So linear, um, the magnify filter is meant to be linear. The wrapping is meant to be clamp to edge. And that's it. Um, they have to set it twice because they're specifying both directions. You can actually specify a wrap in three dimensions because you have three dimensional textures. Um, in Keppel, if you set it to just one, it sets all three dimensions to that one thing. Um, so if like, let's look it up here actually. Where's ping sampler? Ah, ping sampler. Um, and we look at the wrap for ping sampler. We have an array. Uh, we can set that to be the array, so just like that last one, just set it to the same thing. What? Uh, yeah, because I'm a moron. Um, fuck's sake. Let's not set that variable to be completely the wrong thing, because we were trying to prove a point, which is that wrap. We're going to set the wrap to be that same array and everything's fine, or you can set it to be um, just the keyword repeat and that's also fine so you can specify these to be different in different dimensions or whatever so anyway long story short this should have been what we were using reset fbos 
that might have had an effect on our um, our texture here, but I doubt it. The variable temp one is undefined. That is true. Um, I was actually interested in um, pong sampler in this case and saying continue. Now we've still got our squares there. Something is rather about this. So we'll have to see what that is. Okay, what time is it? Oh, it's already gone nine. I'm going too slow, but we'll get there. Um, if we ignore this ug ugliness and march straight on, um, then we'll make more mistakes. And that is what this stream is all about. Me <laughs> doing things wrong. So that should be our um, two frame buffers set up correctly. And then we've got the ping pong thing down here, which is... We're going to loop 10 times. We are going to... Um, render a quad. This is where they're setting up this uniform, the horizontal. We just pass it in as a keyword argument. Um, they're binding their texture, whichever texture is relevant. We're gonna, we'll see that soon in ours. Um, we're, they're flipping, inverting, whether it's horizontal each time, uh, or negating that. Um, negating? What am I talking about? And it has a special case for the first iteration. What is it doing with first iteration? Um, Not a whole lot. Can you see what they're doing? Oh yeah, it's right there, dumbass. Wait a second. Oh, okay, yeah, the first time, definitely use this, otherwise ping pong between them. Interesting. Okay, yes, of course, this is the equivalent of, in our one, the first time round, we have to read from bright sampler, and then we want to go ping, and then pong, ping, pong, ping, pong, ping, pong, ping. Um, so that's what they're achieving there. So let's take this. We'll do it the old uh, side by side copying treatment that we did for the other code. So let's maximize this. Let's split it horizontally. Let's give ourselves a little buffer. Let's stick some code in it. Minimize down to its reasonable size. Let's turn on C mode so we get a little color highlighting, and let us write some code. Um, and we'll just transcribe it pretty literally. And just before I dive into this, because I know I'm not going to be paying attention to you properly when I'm doing that, I will look what's going on over here. Um, Postscript interpreter GPU. He's off the rails. Someone give him something strong. Um, Just discussions of the C checking kind of stuff going on. <laughs> C has the type inference. <laughs> yeah, if you tell it, to, as uh, Arusius says, if you tell it that it's a uh, void star, then C infers it is indeed a void star. Actually, uh, we shouldn't mock too hard, seeing as common lisp's approach is rather fucking similar when it comes to declarations. Declaration is saying, I know what this is. It doesn't even, doesn't even have to really consider whether it's valid or not. There are lots of times that people, one of the classic ones, actually, yeah, seeing as there might be uh, new common lispy people around that are interested in the uh, types of things. Yeah, right. Let's, uh, let's do this because I think it's worth it. Values. Um, using values like this, this is the, how you normally specify multiple return values. Let's just bring up the REPL. Foo. So now we've got two values returned. Um, writing it like this is a way of specifying that this thing is like a void function. It doesn't return anything. Um, but if you, and we call it there and we can see no value, but if you bind this, so like say x is foo, um, then what you're gonna get is nil. That is as it should be according to the spec, but that does not mean that the type of this function is um, null and it doesn't mean it's cons. It's values, this is the type. So if you declare the type of this function, so uh, declaim um, that the f type, oh, let's just do 
Is it f-type? Yeah, I think it might be. f-type um, function, no arguments to something. It returns values. Foo. Is that correct? Yeah, that's how you need to do that. So here we're defining the type of the function foo. We're claiming the type of function foo. The return type is values. It's not null. It's not cons. Even though it's you get nil bound to x, it doesn't mean that this returned a list. It doesn't mean it returned nil. Um, that's just what you get for binding something that has no return value. People fuck this up, and then they go and into um, here and say, like, declare speed three or something like this. Declare what is it? Optimize. Um, and if you've said this is a list or nil or whatever, it, your types are wrong and you've lied to the compiler and it's gonna propagate that information and you will get fucked up bugs. Uh, so be really careful with that um, in general. Values is not, is like void, it's not nil. Word of warning. It's not like I've done that before. <laughs> so yes. Uh, let's get back to your regularly scheduled programming. Right, horizontal is true. First iteration. We're not gonna have underscores. We have some dignity. Uh, is true. Amount is spelt incorrectly. Um, shader blur use. We don't have to do that. We're gonna do it our way. We did it our way. Right. We're gonna go do times. This time we can actually do this. Um, it's gonna be i. It's gonna be less than amount. And we are at some point we're going to do map G. So let's just write that bit first. We're going to be calling H blur pipeline uh, with this. The thing, just this. We're, we're calling this. And we are going to be doing the with FBO bound thing as well. We're going to be bounding something here. We'll get to what that is. In fact, I'm just going to do it with these because they show up bright blue. Uh, it's just a better reminder to me of what's going on. Um, Jason is saying, technically, anytime you ask for more values than were returned, you get nil. That's good to know. Thank you. Um, SICP. Oh, man. I, I <laughs> can't look at SICP stuff right now. Declarations are CLs volatile. They, the, but that's the thing. They're great, though. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool that all this stuff is there, and I would not use common lisp nearly as much i would have like i wouldn't be doing capital if that stuff wasn't there but care must be taken um it doesn't raise a condition to accept fewer that is true um that's the thing like if you get the one of the things is like sometimes people have turned off safety so they do speed three safety zero and then they don't get the warnings uh, the thing's just like, oh, fuck, okay, you're the boss. Um, but often when this comes up, it's that someone's got this in their code with like speed three. And so SBCL's inlining some stuff. And then it goes, wait a second, you've said that this is um, is nil or a list or implied it in some way, but you've returned values. Um, so that's incorrect. And so you, you get like, it comes up in quick lisp, like, oh, your package is fucked and it's going to be removed, which is great. And um, and I, that's not sarcasm, by the way. It's fucking awesome. I love Quick Lisp and how it work, how it's uh, managed. Um, yeah, so that so that ends up coming up. So it's um, and the people get confused and they go to S like SBCL. I ask you, oh, it doesn't work, and it's like you did it wrong. <laughs> you did it wrong. But it's one of those cases that catch people out. So it's kind of annoying. It's, it's like in. It's one of those places that has that C++ quality of looking at like at what the result is does not actually tell you the behavior of the language. You go look at it and go, oh, it binds, it's nil. Cool, the type's nil. Um, more or less. C++ has that everywhere, which is fun. What were I, what was we doing? Oh yeah, what was we doing? Mm -hmm. We English, that's what I am. Me am. Right. Um, we're going to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, <laughs> uh, it's so bad. Right. Um, what do we do? They're setting up the frame buffer. That's what we do with with FBO bound. 
they set up the um, uniform. That's what we've done here. This sampler needs to be replaced as well. Um, binding texture, that's this bit. Um, so we don't need ternary operators, we've got if. So if first iteration, then um, the sampler is bright sampler. Oh, and that's why they're using horizontal is one zero. So, um, yeah. fair enough. We'll have to put our ugly a little lower down. Um, what am I doing? Horizontal. Um, if first iteration, otherwise, let's have a look. What are we doing? Um, bright sampler. Actually, I'm not entirely happy with copying it this way. We will do the um, we will do the if first um, iteration bright sampler. We're gonna go back to doing if horizontal one zero, which is black, but it'll have to do. Um, but this I would like to just do current sampler. Um, the, what's the yeah okay so then we've got why did I use stars there that's silly current sampler is um, ping sampler and next sampler is pong sampler that's so why I suppose we're gonna have a current FBO and next FBO as well Just ping and pong. And then we just do that we, we are binding the current FBO and we're using the current sampler. And then after that, what we do is there is a there's one that rotates and it's annoying because I was taught this by Shimera on this stream and I can't remember the name of the macro that swaps places. Is it swap F? No. Is it Rotate F. Oh, it might be. It takes any number of set F expression places, evaluates all the expressions in turn, then assigns to each place the value of the form to its right. Rightmost form gets the value of the leftmost. Yes. So we can do current sampler, next sampler, which is just going to swap them. Um, and then we do current FBO. Next FBO. Also, I've got these around the wrong way and written them wrong. So it's wrong in every possible fashion. Um, we're going to read from bright sampler and write into Pong. And then we're going to swap. And then we're going to read from. Um, wait a second. No, let's get this right. First time round, we're reading from bright sampler and we're writing into Ping. And then they both swap. So this is now current. Yes. Then we're going to uh, read from ping and we're going to write into pong. And then we keep spinning. That's fine. That will actually work. Ah, so first iteration, iteration is false. So yes, then we have to do that thing. I mean, first iteration, like, it's first iteration if i equals zero. So I don't see why you need to have that flag there. If we can just do if zero i, you know? Um, and then we've got a flip horizontal. Um, so we're just gonna set up horizontal to be not horizontal. Oh shit, okay. And I know why the thing looked shitty as well, because um, we weren't clearing the FBOs. We never cleared them. Like at all. We cleared this FBO, and then we drew into, yeah, we drew into scene FBO. That's where we got the bright sampler. And then we never cleared, oh, let's just clear these guys. Remove those guys there. Uh, with FBO bound, we want to clear the FBO, the current FBO, right? Yeah, and then we got this nice circular 
gush and blur going on there and loads of it is out of range um it's because it's all bloomed out i think this is correct this is actually looking okay and what time are we at we're at 25 we still have time to do this so we get a properly blurred image all blurred stuff here let's just say that's proper proper yes um, and then we're going to blend both the textures. So we've got this nice simple thing where we're going to go and combine them again. Um, oh, this is actually really a relief. Let's just check in over here because probably someone's um, going to spot something that I've done wrong. Um, speaking of which, CLSDL2 TTF is in danger of being removed and taking sketch with it. Oh, shit. What happened there? Uh, because it depended on a transitive dependency that got removed. Um, oh, okay, yeah, so I'm guessing that would be... Because I saw a couple of errors today. In fact, let me just uh, check. I've got the RSS feeds here of quick list failures. Fucking awesome work, again, by, um, uh, by Zach for making uh, RSS feeds for every single project so you can listen to the issues. It's dope. Um, so yeah, actually, I can see an error with CL couple SDL TDF um, right here, and the reason is unhandled compile file error in thread. Blah 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 blah. BG Alpha is that's a bunch of warnings. Warnings. I hate warnings. I thought I didn't ship any code that was firing warnings in SBL, CCL or ECL. Normally careful on that, but I must admit I haven't checked this library in a while. It's going to be it's going to be trivial. Um, it's going to be garbage collection, isn't it? And that is okay. We'll update those libraries. So basically, before SDL um, put garbage collector hooks on foreign objects that were created in its front end API, its kind of nice API, so it would garbage collect foreign objects for you. Um, that's caused problems for people um, who have been using this in real projects. So it became a massive pain in the ass. It's happened too many times. So they removed that because, again, you're using SDL. Just do the management yourself. <laughs> Free the objects that you're making. Um, yeah, it's going to be in here somewhere. Oh, why can't I see it, though? But I would bet it's something to do with that uh, garbage collection stuff. So yeah, that'll be a hopefully be like a hour fix or something like that. Most um, da, 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 da. there's a PR waiting for the maintainer to add depth the depth in explicitly. Um, oh yeah, Chase is saying it. It explicitly makes use of the trivial garbage package. Um, you've just explained everything I badly explained. That's awesome. So yeah, it doesn't use finalizers anymore. So it stopped pulling in that and. CL, SDL, to TD. We shouldn't add a reference to that. We should remove the use of um, trivial garbage. Like, it's a bad idea to have it in there in the first place. Uh, one of those things I really hate... I mean, they're pretty careful with it, actually, because they do it on object construction, and it doesn't seem like there are many ways of getting hold of an SDL object once you've uh, constructed it. Um, other, but... One second. Let's... Uh, you should have a grown MPX. Yeah. Um, doodle time. I mean, it's the thing. Once you, they, like, you allocate some foreign object, um, and then you've got a Lisp object wrapping it, and we've got that pointer. So this is the Lisp side. And then we've got trivial garbage that's going to clean this up when the Lisp object is freed. But the problem is, if you've got any other way of getting hold of this pointer, like any other way, even accidentally, even through some other object, then you've got a reference to this, um, like a pointer, that is going to become completely invalid when this thing, uh, when this object uh, gets destroyed. So as soon as someone loses a reference to this, it goes and frees this memory, and this reference is now fucked, which I really hate. It's just that it's not possible to control it properly without, you know, like uh, keeping track of every pointer that's passed backwards and forwards, and so it's just a losing game. I. Ugh. I'm luckily in SDL, in, sorry, Keppel in general, when it's using SDL, doesn't touch any of the front end stuff. It tries to only use the back end stuff. Um, so, yeah. I, I, but, yeah, for the TTF stuff, I must admit, I will have just been using it as simple as possible. 
Um, okay, short term, the support uh, short term, the support projects have just had the dependency added explicitly. Um, Enfiano doesn't control the TTF one. Oh, that's interesting. Um, okay, then to be honest, if it got removed, that would be a good case for. Ah, uh, oh, yeah, but it would take Sketch out, which would be sad. Hmm. Yeah, that would be a bum. Right. Anyway, we, we're getting somewhere with a blur. We've got half an hour. Focus, Chris. <laughs> Focus. I've read about that in books. Um, blending both textures. Cool. We're just going to take a scene and the blue blur, and then we're going to do that, and we're going to um, and we're going to words. We're going to many words. I'm going to such words right now. All of you will understand what I'm saying. It'll be amazing. Um, No, if we wanted to be in render, probably where I already was. Um, P fun G, compose, um, bloom, and it's going to be a lot like this. Oh, I'm going to do something disgusting here. Unmatched parens. Oh, it's the worst. Ah, oh, quickly fix them. There we go. This is heartbreaking. Um, in fact, we don't need to create another one of these. We've already got this function. So let's just get rid of that. Um, def pipeline g compose bloom p line. And hblur vert is going to go in here, taking effect 2. Um, and we're just going to call it compose frag. Um, we're going to pass in some uniforms and uniform sam0, which is going to be a sampler 2D, and sam1, which is a sampler 2D. And then we are going to let star. We're going to sum them together. So we're going to additively blend them with. Uh, so we're going to get the texture. What are we going to do? What are we doing? Sam0, UV. Sam one UV da, 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 da. sample both of those textures. Oh, that's whistling out the RPG. RGB. One of those. All of those. Um, add them together. And then they're doing the tone mapping stuff. And that's it. Alright. Okay, so we are going to we are going to uh, swizzle them. So we would like them to be vec three, x y z. That's not y. And then we take our final color, which is the sum. We do the tone mapping stuff on it. Um, we calculate the luma uh, from that final color. And we put that on the end because that's going to get passed to um, the FXAA stuff. And final color seems to be okay. Let's say compose frag takes a vec2. Let's go back to play with verts. And we're going to get rid of this. Actually, we need to write this into another FBO. Right, um, let's do that then. Um, that's with FBO bound. Uh, we're gonna write back into the scene FBO. Sure. We're gonna write into the scene FBO. Um, we're gonna clear it first, why not? Um, scene FBO, and we're doing that especially because it's got depth and we don't want fragments to be dropped. Um, then we are going to, I think that's correct anyway, uh, map G. We're going to compose bloom pipeline. We are going to do the Nivea get to quad stream. We're going to specify Sam zero and Sam one to be things, which I'm desperately trying to remember. Um, we're going to wrap this paren around all of this block because the last thing that we wrote into would be the next sampler. 
So now we can take next sampler as one input and shit. No, we can't write into scene sampler here. Wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, scene FBO and scene FBO2. Did we actually use this at all? I think this was originally going to be my ping pong buffer and then I was just wrong. Uh, no, we didn't use that. So let's. Uh, we don't need two attachments. We probably don't need depth either. No. Um, scene FBO2. And the reason we can't use that is we need the scene FBO. Uh, so no, the scene sampler, which was our original um, color <laughs> capture. So that's that. That's the next sampler. What else have I done wrong? It's going to be something. It's going to be lots of things. Fuck it. Let's do it. Let's do this. Um, that writes that into that FBO. So then hopefully, hopefully then we can just do this. And we're writing into... Um, Scene FBO2. We're going to need to reset the FBOs. Whoops. If we've... Ah, see, we haven't got a sampler for Scene FBO2 yet either. Um... Oh, whatever. Doesn't matter what it's called. Let's call it Final Sampler. Sure. Final fight. All day, this fall. Coming soon. Right. Final sampler is from scene FBO2, attachment zero. Rather than scrolling backwards, let's just do reset FBOs. Shit's good. Come down here. We are writing into scene FBO2. And that means that this is called final sampler. <laughs> and it's a complete disaster. So, why is that? Um, well, I mean, we can see the clear color there, so that can't be good. What are we doing wrong? Let's just have a look. So, if we draw text scene sampler, there's jack shit in it. That's interesting. Why is that? I mean, that it's gray is helpful because that explains where all the gray came from. Um, scene sampler is the first attachment of scene FBO. Scene FBO has two attachments. Did we clear this? I bet I cleared it. Yeah. So yeah, I cleared it and then I drew into it. And then we clear, oh, we clear the wrong FBO. I bet someone's already spotted that. That looks a bit better. And that looks terrible. <laughs> what the fuck? We worked that hard for that? That's bullshit, man. Look at all that. Oh, it's just bloomed out of hell. That's disgusting. Oh, and the sky too. Okay, so. I mean... What happens if you drop the exposure really hard? Where is that? Like, oh yeah, we've just got it in an implicit uniform, haven't we? So we can probably just go, exposure is 0.35. Let's set it to like basement level. Yeah, so these are, <laughs> these, are these bloomed values. Ick. That is rather disappointing. Um, so we've got something going on there, but it's pretty nasty. Are the values really that high? I mean, we can bring the floor up a bit, like, but that really doesn't deal with the fundamental problem of just how... It feels like after the, um... Aggregation of all this stuff, there was meant to be a divide or something. So we ping pong backwards and forwards blurring. And that means every time, every time we blurred, 
we were... No, we're not, though. You're not adding that every time. Surely. No, because we're multiplying, we're just reading some values out, and then we're multiplying them, and we should be spreading that energy out. If anything, it should have got darker. This is definitely brighter than... Or at least... We just spread that damage out. That is... Sad panda. Um, let's just see, let's just see the damage in the chat because we worked quite hard to get this failure. Um, a few questions coming through. Borrowed us to see vid today. Oh, that's really cool. I haven't seen vid in ages. Like, uh, we actually, like, like, ages back, I got a prototype of Sketch working on top of Keppel. And uh, there were some performance gains, even without changing the structure of the app. Um, not massive ones, but noticeable. Um, so, yeah, it'd be, it'd be lovely to get that project kind of rolling again one day. Um, ethics. Right. Any Monkey Dust fans here? Great show. Um... Da, 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 da. Which CL are people using? SPCL. And distributing real apps, yeah. You, you, as Jace says, generally you're dumping your image. Uh, there's some nice ways of, well, there's some vaguely portable ways of doing that, but there are actually some advantages to targeting specific things. Like SPCL has a flag for compressing the image when you dump it. So because you're essentially dumping a load of RAM, you get quite a large executable, but it's very compressible. So you get it down to something like 15 meg, which is still pretty big, but you know. It increases like start time a little, but you know it pays off. But again, if it's a large game, who cares about the size of the exe? Just do the dump and go. Um, but you don't want things like uh, swank and stuff like that in there. So generally, it's you have some process where you're running it from the command line, where you actually just load your project and then dump immediately without starting any systems. So then you've got something kind of clean to start with. And you can specify the entry point, so your main function, especially, essentially. Um, it's great. It's really cool. I've done it for all the game jams, so I participated in which is like two. <laughs> oh, dear. You cleaned the wrong F cleared the wrong FBO. Yeah, you got it, man. Um, I think you said it's a nuke, yeah. Monkey Dust was a uh, animated comedy, uh, which is very, very British from... Oh, fuck, I can't even remember how long ago it was now. It, it's bleak as fuck, and it just reminds me of, like... It's very, very UK to me. If you've lived in the UK for a long time, you, and you're kind of done... <laughs> It really touches a, a special place. Um, Barrett, yeah, you'll probably enjoy it. It's uh, Yeah, it's cool. It's not stuff I can really quote here. It doesn't make any sense in that fashion, but... Oh, that looks absolutely terrible. I mean, yeah, essentially it's Bloom, but at what cost? Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. Right, um... So what to do now? Let's have a look at this. Did we did we cock something up here? I don't think I did. Wait, really? No, that's correct. That's correct. I was worried it was, you know, I was ballooning. So that nice part of the uh, Gaussian curve, of course, is that the area underneath sums to one. So that we're just, we know that when we're sampling from other places, the we're going to, 
we've divided ourselves slightly um, and then we're adding on some other values and that will total up to one. So we're not, it shouldn't be um, massively increasing the number. I didn't explain that at all well. I barely get it in my head. Myself, what is going on here? I guess one thing I can do is I can look at the shader and see how I'm fucking up. Um, let's just have a look at this guy. Oh, there it is. You see it? These are all weight zero. This is meant to be I. So that's definitely one problem. I doubt it's all of it. Uh, <laughs> but saying that, that helped a lot. That did help a lot. Okay, so it's not very nice though. We've got 15 minutes left. What I want to do really is I would like to have an object that is rather bright moving behind here and I'd like that to bloom. Um, but there'll be a lot of things to do to get to that point. And I'm just trying to work out if we can do it in time. Because what we'd need is um, to get one of these uh, objects, which are not participating in this Bloom stuff at all. Um, We need to get that to do the blue stuff as well. Now, how do we do that? Um, actually, it might just work. Just having a think. Be with you in a minute. Um, let's go and have a look to see how this ball is rendered. So let's just look at REPL. Let's look at things. There's a bunch of asymp objects uh, that we imported, but there's also a ball, a box, a box, which is this these three things down here. So let's go to things. Let's look at make ball, um, which is down here. And we look to see how that is drawn. So it's a thing and things are drawn up here. Um, some pipeline with norms. This is going to be over in render. So let's have a look at that. Some vert stage here. But what's interesting about this is it takes um, takes two takes two GPU arrays in the stream. It's a stream of two um, data sources. So we've got the position um, normal texture stuff um, and we've got what amounts to the um, what's it called tangent and bitangent data. So I'm rather confused by that because I didn't think that our objects had that. So sphere here. Um, actually does have two components. It has vert. Which it got from. So look at this. Yeah, which it got from um, this function. This returns GPU arrays for a sphere of a given radius and you can also specify lines of longitude and latitude. But it also got, it also called test, which is a function which apparently produces um, tangents and bitangents for this. I am skeptical, to be honest. I guess this is what this was meant to be here. I don't think this works though. I mean, it must be working to a degree because we've got stuff down there. Let's go and have a look at the normals of that object and make sure they're correct. Um, the way we could do that is if we go to render and we go to... No, let's go to things because that's where things are drawn. This stage down here, when we enabled it, um, put... Oh, look at all that blooming. <laughs> all of the normals bloom now. That's hilarious. <laughs> Fucking awesome. Um... Anyway, um, where was I? Yeah, that draws all of the normals of all of the objects. Um, all of the meshes for asymp, because we're in the draw function for asymp thing. 
Um, so what I'm actually going to do is copy this. I'm going to turn it off and I want to put it in the drawer that was up here. Where is it? Here. Um, and do this. Now we should get normals from this. Now this actually looks pretty terrible. Look at that fuck. That is... Oh, but is this... That's probably taking the normal map into account though, isn't it? They're vaguely in the right direction, so maybe this does work. Um, I guess one way we can check is if we go and... We go and inspect the things list and we jump down to the bottom um, and we go and find the ball and we just go and make a variable to store that in. And yep, we're on that kind of rampage for the end of the stream, so I'm not going to be checking the chat for a little bit. Um, so you will see mistakes that I'm going to <laughs> not um, see until the end. So we've got the ball and then we're going to get the um, normals from that ball, which is this sampler. Um, let's just put that in temp1 for a bit because I'm going to swap this out. I'd like to sample. I'm going to make a texture. Um, I actually need to know a bit about what is in temp1. So um, what I'd like to do is just make a one-dimensional texture with a single uh, vector in it um, that points in the z direction, which if I remember correctly was away from the surface because it's taking into account the tangents and bitangents. So what do we have we got here? We have a um, 2D texture, which we've got we're gonna have here. Um, it is of what type? Why am I not seeing that? Oh yeah, because we're looking at the sampler and not the texture. Um, it's an RGBA8. Okay, so element type RGBA8. Cool. Um, ah, I just I just thought of something. This is incorrect because um, when we're using RGBA8 to store a vector three, it's going to be remapped. So this should actually be 0 0.5, I think. What is it going to be? It's going to be... Let's go and have a look at the uh, stage. One second. Render. Um, is there a remap in here? No. What is it called? Times 0. Just search for 0. 0.5. It's going to be in here somewhere. Um, no, it's not apparently. What the fuck have you done? Um, normal from map and then we go times 2 minus 1. So 0.5 um, times 2 is going to be 1, minus 1 is going to be 0, so that's not going to be correct. Um, so yeah, so our target we have to do it 2 and divided by 2, which is 1. Wait a second, what? We... Ah, well, I don't know why I'm having problems with this now. We looked into this another episode. Um, play with list. We even made a fallback normal map. Here it is. It's already here. Fuck. Yeah, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 1. That's it. This one's fine. These can't be zero, but we've already got this. So let's just use it. It's a one by one texture. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this sphere and I'd like to remove its normal map. And I'm going to do that by... Um, set f normals temp zero temp zero and then formal ah there we go now it's behaving properly sweet and the reason i want to do that is because i also want to set the uh, sampler of this uh, which is the albedo um, map i want to sample i want to make a texture um, and again it's going to be a one by one it's going to have exactly one thing in it which is just that and um we're going to say element type. In fact, it might even be able to infer the element type like that. So now it's white um, and one part of it's blooming because it's quite bright. And so we've got this sampler. So, in fact, we might even just say fuck it and, and um, mess with it in the fragment shader. Maybe. Maybe. <sighs> okay, so we've got this ball. Let's get out of the way. Um, 
Problem is, it's a bit small. So, actually, I'm going to make a new one. <laughs> so, like, what should we do? Uh, go to the REPL. We're already in the REPL. Ooh, no, don't do that. Um, we should... I think I knew roughly where to put this, actually, because I was looking at this before the stream. Make ball. Um, it's going to be at... Where are we? Um, 70, 120, zero, something like this. Um, hopefully, if I'm not wrong, that's over here somewhere. I'm wrong, shit. Oh no, there it is. Not too far off. Um, but I did make it the wrong size. So let's um, just pop the latest thing off things, which is it's got rid of it and let's make a ball, but we want it to be at least 10. So that's a lot bigger. That's pretty fucking big actually. Let's just drop it down to eight. Um, that's cool. And then we're gonna go and replace the things that we did a minute ago. So we're gonna make it, yeah, we're gonna make the wrong one. Um, rather than temp zero, let's do this to first of things. So now that's white, but it's still got its normal map. So now we're gonna go and replace its normal map like we did with the other one. Do, 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 do. Yes, first of things. And now it's just a well, gray, but essentially white uh, sphere that is in the wrong fucking place. So I'd like to take that. Um, let's just go dev bar. Ball is the first of things. Um, so position of ball is that. We're going to set up position of ball to be, what is it? Let's try 8120 okay that's moving it in that direction so 8120 um 70 where'd i put it damn it ah there it is oh perfect that's exactly where i want it and I want to make that fucker really bright. And now how can I do that? Um, what's the easiest way that I can hack that in real fast? Um, let's go to a render and let's go to the fragment shader. Cause I think they all use frag shade with norms. Yes, frag stage with norms. Um, let's add an extra thing in here. Just called malt and it's gonna be a float. And the color is then going to be multiplied by malt. Everything's going to go away because currently that's zero, which is no good. But we've got this nice bloom. Actually, it's the best looking thing of this whole fucking stream. There's these uh, nice bloomed little lines. Um, but anyway, back to the thing. What time have we got left? We've got two minutes. That's really not enough. Um, let's go to play with Earth's Lisp. Let's go to the pipeline which draws things. Oh yeah, it's called draw. That's in um, things. What have we got? Come on, look around, look around. Look around you. Um, we're going to set malt to be one, uh, which is not a float. And say continue. Um, so that thing is now visible. Uh, if we go down here and set this to be malt one, now everything's back. Um, and then we're gonna make, take this draw thing. Let's get rid of the normals right now because we know they're correct. Um, and we're gonna make a special one just for bull. I think the type is called bull. And then we're just gonna say, it's a hundred. Right, so that's really bright. And that's roughly what I wanted to do. I wanted to see that this thing, the bloom was leaking around this pillar. Um, let's get a position where we can actually look at this guy. Um, that doesn't look entirely shitty. That looks pretty shitty. Um, yeah, that would be cool. And then we're just going to take, where is it? Um, come on, Chris, not much time left. Well, not any time left. Um, go play with Verts. Go to the loop, and then all we're going to do is we're going to say, which way moves it further back towards us? If we change this to 50, oops, 
it moves closer. Cool. So if we put it about 40 and say that's the starting point, and then we're going to say it's uh, B3 plus, um, no, what's it going to be? No, we positioned it there. Let's say that the X position is um, 40 plus sine of now um, multiplied by 100. And then that should be going backs and forwards. There it goes. And um, I can see some horrible shadowing and shit on it, but it doesn't matter. And actually, let's just bring it down from there to about 60. Um, and let's turn off. Can we do not blurring on the other ones? Um, I think we can set the threshold to be a little higher, and that'll probably work. So let's go back to render. Let's look at the threshold is greater than 2. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, yeah, I got malt W there for some reason. 2. And we're just going to bring down the bloom on the other things. And so then hopefully this is the only thing blooming. And so, yeah, that's uh, not great. Not great at all. But it's, <laughs> it's closer than it was. Um, where the fuck is... Uh, One second. There's that dot product somewhere. Here we go. Oh no, this was uh, calculating the brightness. Oh, fuck it. Where is it? Oh yeah, it's in calc light. Um, drag stage for norms. Cool. Let's just say uh, when malt is less than, not like this, um, two. Um, if not, is less than two. <laughs> and otherwise, set f um, fuse power to be a hundred. Does that work? <laughs> no. Um, fuck you. What are we doing? Is this always going into that error. Okay. Fuck it. We can't do that hack. So we'll just have to make do with the shitty shadowing. But yeah, we've got an object. It's blooming slightly around that thing. I'm not a big fan of, of what we've made, but it is at least there. Um, so yes, that is all we're going to get time to do tonight. Um, so thank you so much for stopping by. I've got a few seconds for questions and shit like that. And um, then we'll just we'll call it an evening. So one of the things that I've when I was doing Bloom before um, was rather than doing as many passes, you would downsample the image and then bloom that and then add that back. Um, I'm just wondering if we can bloom, if we can, uh, let's go into play with verts actually and just go rather than 10 times, let's go 50 times. There we go. So that's kind of working. Medellin saying push. Yes, I should have done that sooner, shouldn't I? Um, yes, it will be called Kind of Bloom. Woo! Right, let's go through the chat briefly and then we will we'll we'll, we'll chill. Um You mentioned Mon Monkey Dust before, I looked at it. Yes, awesome. Push now, good point. That was 10 minutes ago. Um, so let's have a look. Miss of color. Sorry, I'm just skimming through to see if there was anything else. Thank you for the ping pong show, no problem. Um, cheers, Barad. And Median, yes, we have pushed. And it's pretty bloomy. It, it certainly is. Gray, but essentially white brick ping pong. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that's it for now. I should be back next week. I don't think there's anything that should stop me doing that. Um, 
but yeah, that's all. And I hoped, uh, I'm hoping I'll get a bit of time to do some type system stuff this weekend. That'd be really cool. Actually, if I get some of that working, because at the moment I've got um, like parameterized types and stuff that like working and the inference is working quite well. Um, but I haven't done generalization of the top level functions. So once I need to do generalization, instantiation, um, obviously, and then, and yeah, then we've probably got something that's actually useful at checking shit and um, might be worth showing off because it's kind of fun. Um, what I would like to do, there's a library which I've, I've been kind of chewing over doing for ages and I've made prototype versions of before. Um, I'm going to completely replace it. It's called Checkmate. And the idea is it allows you to define a type system for a static subset of common lists. Um, and then you can implement your own type checking on top of that and yeah, check code. And then it's up to you to handle the code generation stuff after that. So whether you want to go from that to GLSL or you want to go from that back to common lisp, just with all the declares in the right places, that would kind of be up to you. So that would be, that be it. I think that's all. Thanks so much for stopping by. Um, and I will catch you a little later if I can go and find the button to stop streaming. Here it is.